Okay, there we go. Now it's live. Hello, everyone. Okay. My name is Lars. I'm uh, connecting to Duncan, who's in Britain, here from our OCE Days event in Berlin. And uh, we are here on the global stream of the OCE Days. And we will now hear a presentation of Duncan about uh, architecture. Uh, thank, uh, hello, Duncan, and thank you that you are um, joining us in this event and present uh, your work to our community. We are very thrilled. And now I give it up to you. Okay. Thank Let's you start. very much. You can hear me all all right. Thank you very yes. much for inviting me. I'm based in the, on the south coast of England in Brighton at the University of Brighton. I'm an architect and uh, an educationalist and an environmental activist. That's how I like to... Uh, describe myself, and I've been lucky enough to be involved in some very interesting architectural projects. Uh, I'm at the moment writing a book, so what I'm going to do is talk to you about the sorts of things that influence the way I practice and teach, but also I'm going to talk about the amazing experience I've had the last five weeks, five months actually, writing a book which I've called The Reuse Atlas, and it will be published in the spring. So I'm going to go to my presentation now. And uh, hopefully you're going to be able to see it, which would be great. So hopefully you can see this. So, uh, yeah, the book's called The Reuse Atlas. And what I'm particularly interested in is this idea of the hidden consequences of architecture and design. A lot of people don't actually think about what it takes to design and build uh, and construct a building or to make a phone or whatever it is. And uh, it's the sort of thing that preoccupies me all the time. So this is a slide that, of a, a protected bit of rainforest anywhere. Um, and that's illegal mining. And the people mining those forests, they're supplying the construction industry and other industries, whether it's iPhones or cars or whatever, with the minerals required to make the things that they produce. These are our, this is part of our supply chain. These, are, these people are part of our supply chain as well. That's two slides spliced together, but it's an open cast copper mine in Chile. And those people are supplying the construction industry and other industry industries with copper. You can't design buildings without using copper. And interestingly, in the UK at the moment, because uh, of many reasons, political reasons, we've been encouraged to uh, frack which is to, in, from my point of view, squeeze the last bit of fossil fuels out of uh, the geology that we live above. And it's interesting because it reminds me of other eras when we've been in recession, when the gov our government has encouraged us to burn fossil fuels to regenerate uh, commerce, to make uh, the economy better. And it always feels like a desperate uh, act for me when uh, we're having to burn fossil fuels to make planet Earth better, because it's, uh, it's quite incorrect, obviously. More specifically to the industry I'm in, which is the construction industry, um, is this amazing statistic that, and this is apparently an improvement, but for every five houses we build in the UK, we waste a house worth of material going to landfill. So we throw away one house for every five houses built. So this is quite a startling fact, how inefficient and wasteful the construction industry is and it's important to focus on the construction industry because basically half of everything mined and produced goes into the stuff we build the stuff we live in the stuff we work in and it hasn't always been the case this is a couple of images of uh, uh, Pakistan's second city this is the historical core and these are buildings that work well in very hot summers they keep you cool in the summer and warm in the winter, and they don't require the burning of fossil fuels for air conditioning. It's just an innate understanding of the potentials of the materials. In this case, it's Adobe uh, Earth uh, walls, uh, but also it gets so dry in the summer that what you're looking at are actually air scoops, little ventilation towers that actually capture any little draft of air uh, and allow these buildings to be comfortable in the summer and warm in the winter. But that's just building with the materials underneath your feet rather than importing lots of materials from around the world. And we've obviously, obviously got to think about the planet that we exist in. And I say it's one planet, not three, because I'm referring to this concept of one planet living. If everybody 
in the world lived like my colleagues and I do in the UK, we would need at least three, if not four planets worth of stuff to exist. So we're actually benefiting at the moment because other people are living in poverty in other parts of the world. We're consuming too much. And I believe we don't need to consume so much to exist as we do at the moment. So it's all about the clever management of resources. And that's what I've got preoccupied with and focused on this idea that um, we're looking for new types of resources. But unfortunately, I think humankind hasn't has never been that good, really, at managing resources. Of course, there are uh, people all around the world, communities who've lived in harmony with the natural world for a long time, but there's a lot of people that haven't. And this is an interesting photograph because it's a photograph of the last 23 North American bison from just over 100 years ago. And after that photograph was taken, another 10 were shot. So actually, all the North American bison that are alive now are all descended from 13 North American bison that for some reason were not shot. So we took that population right to the edge. And we're doing it now with rhinoceroses and um, elephants and tigers. But actually, and they, I cheer up in a minute, so don't worry, it's not all going to be doom and gloom. But these two slides remind me that up until the early 1990s, most of China's large cities were sustainable cities. So the diagram on the left is actually explaining how the city is fed by the hinterland, but more importantly, how the city feeds the hinterland. So nutrients from the city feed the hinterland that feeds the city, a nice sustainable circular solution. And really it was only with the importing of so-called Western practices that uh, these things changed. Sorry, I clicked the wrong button there. So what we're trying to do, we're trying to exist as a, sorry, this, isn't, this is how we exist at the moment. So we're, we exist at the moment as a linear metabolism. The diagram there shows um, a graphic that shows how we plunder natural resources. We take them, we make them into something and then we throw them away. But of course, what we're really trying to do is to work as a circular economy. And this diagram says that quite nicely, I think. We've got the technological nutrients and we've also got biological nutrients and they need to be separated because they don't mix very well. Um, and that's what we've got to do. And this double circular image will come up again and again in my presentation. So this is the name of the book that I'm currently working on. And I was lucky enough to be given a five month sabbatical by the University of Brighton in England where I work to do the research for this book. So what I'm gonna talk about now are, is the sort of uh, con the draft content of the book. So it's a case study led book. I am looking at design case studies. Now what I've done with the book is to um, consider it as a response to a book that was written in 2002 called Cradle to Cradle by Michael Braungart and uh, William McDonough and the problem I see with the circular economy at the moment is that we're quite a long way away from achieving it. And it looks like a big leap from where we are to where it may take us. Now, what my book is trying to do is to take you on a step by step journey towards a circular economy. Um, Michael Braungart will, uh, and I appreciate why he says this, he will actually dismiss recycling and reusing as just slowing down the inevitable. Being less bad is not good. And he's right to a certain extent, but there are other issues to consider. So my four main chapters in the book are these steps towards circularity. So step one is, is recycling. Step two is reusing. Step three is reducing the amount of material you use. And step four is ideas of the circular economy. So what I'm going to do now is to show you the the inspirational projects that I've come across over the last four or five months, including a couple I've worked on myself, um, that should hopefully inspire you. So step one, as I said, is recycling, and it's a rather basic first step. And you know, you can criticize it for using fossil fuels uh, in the processing. It creates pollution, perhaps, um, but it does slow down the route to landfill or more likely 
to polluting our oceans. And this is something that I am quite passionate about. We've got to start clearing up this layer of waste and detritus that we've put wrapped planet Earth in. Our oceans are full of plastic, our landfill sites are full, uh, and then we've got our cities and other places that we're existing that sort of literally covered planet Earth in this layer that some people are calling the Anthropocene geological layer, the geological layer that's formed by the existence of human. Now that's quite interesting because at another level you can say that um, we have done all the mining, we need to do everything we need is above ground now. So we just need to reuse what's lying around, whether it's in our oceans as this diagram shows, the areas that of the ocean gyres. And that's a scary image of the sort of thing it looks like. But often you don't see plastic in the water like that. It looks like there's nothing there apart from something floating underneath the sea. But there are people like this. And her, so I want to introduce you to Cyril Gutsch, who's German but lives in New York. And he's a very interesting character that I've just been interviewing. And he set up a company called Parlay for the Oceans. And he comes from a design and branding background. And up until 2012, he worked for large corporate brands designing their products and marketing their products. But he had a bit of an inspirational moment in 2012 where a friend of his phoned him up and said, this guy here, Captain Paul Watson, has been arrested. Now, he's, he's quite a famous environmentalist. For 40 years, he's had a ship called the Sea Shepherd, and he's gone around the oceans trying to stop whaling, save porpoises. And now what he's doing is helping clean up our oceans by raising awareness of illegal fishing and the dumping of illegal fishing nets. So Cyril Gutsch met Paul and formed Parley for the Oceans in 2012. And what's incredible is now Paul Watson carries on doing the work he's already done. But for example, he spent 220 days shadowing an illegal factory trawler fit, uh, ship uh, off what well, event, eventually it was off the Ivory Coast of Africa. And Cyril, who's good at PR and publicity and uses social media very well, drew attention to this illegal ship, which was a huge ship, by the way. And they drew it drew so much negative PR that no harbor in the world would allow this ship to come in to get rid of its uh, stock of illegally caught fish. So they actually scuttled the ship. So the ship doesn't exist anymore now. But what happens also now is that Paul Watson collects illegal fishing nets from our shorelines, from the oceans as well. These ghost, ghost nets that float in the ocean and cause a lot of damage to fish and uh, whales and uh, other sea life and now you can get genes that are made out of this ocean plastic so they go straight for someone like Pharrell Williams who promoted these genes a couple of years ago huge profile a lot of people find out that there's plastic in our oceans and this is the sort of thing we need to do so you can now buy clothes that are made out of ocean plastic with this stuff called bionic yarn and even more ex interesting, I think, you can, you will be able to get a training shoe like this by Adidas, where the sole of the training shoe is actually 3D printed from nylon made from these illegal fishing nets. And the top part of the, of the training shoe is actually ocean plastic. So that's really interesting. Where that training shoe ends up, will that training shoe end up back in the oceans? I don't know, but the idea is that it doesn't. However, I, I'm in the middle of uh, talking to Cyril about this. And what's interesting is he's what also saying, well, we've got to clear up this stuff. But at the same time, he's promoting the use uh, of bioplastics instead. So we still have this addiction to a very dumb material, which at one level for 100 years we thought was intelligent, but it's actually quite dumb. And that's the normal toxic plastic. We've got to wean ourselves off that material and get onto the bioplastics and alternatives. But they're not the only ones doing it. Interface, who are a huge company, been around for 100 years, and they supply the most common carpet tiles for the most boring office environments. 
but actually they've had their own networks project for about five or ten years and that's a project where they partner fishing communities in the Philippines off the Ivory Coast and Cameroon and they get them to clean up their beaches and coral reefs so they pay the fishermen more money to clean up than they get for fishing and that material um, goes to a factory in Italy which has invented a process of unpacking the molecules of old nylon and then repacking it as new material, new virgin material in effect. But at the same time you get the oceans cleaned up, so that, or the beaches cleaned up. So the image on the left shows a typical beach in the Philippines, but actually they collect that stuff and then they make it into a product. At the same time, they're not just treating these communities as charitable enterprises, they're setting up, that the communities are setting up proper businesses. So this is a new material source for an, in, an established industry. And this is why I think recycling is interesting because you're doing two things at once. The communities are gaining wealth, but they're also gaining a cleaned up environment. Also, interestingly, Interface have this amazing commitment and I don't know how they're going to do it, but they're promising to eliminate any negative impact on planet Earth with what they do by 2020. And when you quiz them, and I have, they sound like they know what they're talking about. So it's, it's interesting that a huge multinational corporate like Interface are seeing the value in all of this. And then you've got the sort of interesting designer-led products. Like this is actually uh, a product that you can see on the lampposts in London and other cities, which is a chewing gum bin. And chewing gum in our pavements, people eat gum and they put it on the ground on our pavements. Local councils, they spend a lot of money cleaning it up and it's very difficult to get it off pavements. But this is interesting because it's called the gum drop bin. And when you that bin gets filled up with chewing gum, it's then taken back to the gum drop bin factory and melted down into more gumdrop bins. So that gut, that bin is made out of old chewing gum. So that's a nice little closed loop. This is quite a famous, uh, it's almost a provocation, but it's actually a product now. So this is coffee cups made from coffee grounds. So you can get this material, which is basically compressed coffee grounds, old coffee grounds. And we're all drinking so much coffee that there's just loads of this stuff around. So that was the first basic step, which is in a way about cleaning up, helping to clean up planet Earth and identifying waste material as a, as a, a resource. And hopefully <clears throat> when you reuse it, it's, but it's increasing its value. So step two is reusing materials. And so this is locating materials and then try not to process them. You're not melting them or shredding them up, you are just reusing them without reprocessing. <clears throat> so my first case study is a company called Elvis and Cressy, and they call themselves commodity brokers. They find material sources, material streams, and they partner them up with companies that could do with that material. So it can be as ba basic as wood chip with wood chip boilers, but this is a bit more interesting they actually buy up the world's supply of damaged fire hose every year. And that material is extremely tough. But as soon as it's got holes in it, it tends to be discarded. And it's difficult to dispose of. It's toxic and very tough. So what they do is they clean it up and they make bags out of it. And they make belts out of it and other accessories. And they're making money out of it. And they're also, they've got this preventing all that toxic material from going to landfill or worse which is being built uh, being burnt you've got you guys might be aware of super use there's a great website the superuse.com is a digital resource so you can go online and you can look at lots of different projects from around Europe uh, and that's just a, a digital resource I want you to be aware of if you're not already and super use is this idea that you get a material and when you use it again, you act, it actually goes up the sort of value hierarchy. So um, 
the problem we have at the moment is that a BMW car might be 80% recyclable, but it won't be recycled into new BMW cars. It will be recycled into low-grade aggregates. But they also are developing their designers as well. And um, they've, they've developed this really interesting technique called harvest mapping. And so um, they're based in Rotterdam in Holland. And uh, they've done a lot of their interior designers and architects and product designers. And what they do is they start with Google Earth and they do a 10 kilometer radius from say the site of a, a building project. And they study the map and look for literally materials and stuff hanging around. And then they go and locate this material and they use that as the source of their design product for, for their construction project. And so a number of years ago, they did this, this house, which is made out of 80% uh, of that house is actually material they found lying around. Uh, so uh, someone else was going to be throwing that away. So what I'm going to do now is talk about a project that I co co coordinated, which was called the Brighton Waste House, or which is called the Brighton Waste House. And I built that with the help of 300, over 360 design and construction students. And that's a photograph of some of us on the day it was opened. But that is the first permanent public building made of material other people threw away. So 90% of what you're looking at there was going to go to landfill. And I'm just going to show you some images of this the, the design and construction of this project. So that's us launching. And the way I think it's quite interesting to understand how these projects happen. And um, I'm just going to put my cursor on this guy's face, that guy right in the middle, the older guy in the middle there. He's the site agent. So he, he was a professional builder who ran the construction site, which was based at the University of Brighton. And so the challenge was to initially, we, what we wanted to do is to construct a building made out of that 20% of building material that go, normally goes to landfill to highlight its value. Now, the woman here on the right, that's Kat Fletcher. She, she set up an organization called Freegal in the UK, which has nearly 3 million subscribers now. And that is an online resource for swapping materials. So she was our material finder. But apart from David, who ran the construction site, we had three or four apprentices every day helping us. But the rest of the people building this project were people studying either design or architecture, or they were construction students. So some of these students were only about 15 years old. And here's a 16 year old carpentry student who we filmed a lot of, if you go to the Waste House website, you can see lots of different films. And here we are with um, Michael, who is a 16 year old carpentry student. And he's talking about the uh, ply and timber beam that he has just made. And that is, what the, one of the beams or columns that became the Brighton Waste House. So from right at, right at the beginning, the design and the construction process were filmed. And here, here it is, uh, the first columns going in. And you can see they're quite big. And uh, one of the reasons they're big is because when you use secondhand material, you don't know how strong it is. So your structural engineer has to assume that it's the weakest material on the market. So everything gets a bit big, but there was an ongoing debate about that. So we didn't want to use lots of material. So some of these columns became a bit more hollow. But when they were hollow, we filled them full of salvaged polystyrene. And there's just so much of this, as you all know, from packing, uh, the sort of packing that goes around new televisions or washing machines, whatever, there's a lot of this out there. So we were collecting that quite easily. And then we, we started on site in the in May of 2013. And what was amazing is that when the college that helped provide us with uh, construction students, when that um, uh, went on holiday and when the university closed down, we still had 50 students that worked for the whole of the summer. And that's uh, a photograph of some of them getting a certificate because what was wonderful is that some of the interior architects and the architects worked on site for about five or six weeks and they had a huge amount of knowledge because they'd been on site for five or six weeks. So sometimes it was the interior architects who were leading teams of carpentry students because 
they had the on a hands-on experience so and for a lot of the time also it was the other way around you'd have a 16 year old carpenter showing a 21 year old architect how to do a certain joint or whatever a uh, timber joint so it was a lot of transfer of knowledge which was amazing and obviously we're doing this thing for the first time we don't the thing is when you're working with unusual material sources you the reality is you don't know what the building's going to look like when it finishes we also invited school children every week so we had over 750 school children come to the building site on a on a wednesday and we showed them around and they would bring waste materials and uh what we did at this point and it was cat fletcher from freegal who got us to do this she said why not in, instead of just having it as construction waste why not draw people's attention to other waste streams now when we designed the waste house or the process we didn't design so much of the building but the process to construct a building in 2012 that was the year when dvd shops hire shops that the last of them closed really and so what you had on in the, as a sort of material source is a vast amount of dvds and even the old-fashioned um, vhs videos as well so suddenly the waste procuring stream got absolutely flooded with all this plastic stuff which will just end up a bit of it will be burnt a bit of it will go to landfill but most of it will end up in our oceans so we grabbed hold of that and in between the columns that were construct that made the frame of the waste house we created these cupboards that collected I say cupboards they're big ply boxes that collected this material and the idea is that the, our waste house is a material store for the future but it's storing difficult material the stuff that normally gets thrown away because you don't know what to do with it but we found amazing sources of material like this one we tried to get the school children to arrive with their old toothbrushes and this we did, but we only got about 750 toothbrushes. However, Gatwick Airport contacted us and they collected 25,000 toothbrushes in only four days. And they collected that from a, a cabin service company that was cleaning out the airplanes as they landed. So they land, the passengers leave, and then if you fly for more than two hours, you get given a toothbrush, but you probably never use it. So that is that pile coming off the back of that lorry is what 25,000 toothbrushes look like. Most of them never use. So we use them as insulation in the cavities of our house. Here we can see cavities been filled up with DVDs on the left and then the VHS videos. Now those VHS videos, some of those were from the 1980s and they're still out there. They're still polluting our environment because there's, people don't know what to do with them. They're a complex problem so we're storing them in the waste house until someone comes up with a solution for them they're more benign insulation products we could have filled the whole house with dvds or videos but we wanted to test the the performance of these materials and and draw people's attention to different issues so this for example is part of the two tons of denim that we received and we rolled up this denim into little sausages and it may it acts as a very good insulator by the way it keeps us nice and warm in the winter but what's interesting is the source of this denim and it's a successful business and the business is to import into the uk ready-made jeans jeans made in china they come over to the uk and then they get their legs cut off and in the uk they're sold as denim shorts so what we got was two tons of denim legs that we used as insulation and then the slide on the right shows how our fashion students use that, in, that denim again to make other items of clothing but i think it's really interesting that to buy import a ready-made pair of jeans and then throw away most of it say 60 percent of it is actually a good business plan in the 21st century and it just shows you how the system's a bit warped this is just a, a practical thing, but actually um, the, the, the timber construction relies on uh, when you're doing low energy construction. I haven't mentioned that the idea behind this building is that it's not just a shed. It's a very high performing building. So it's got high levels of insulation. It's well sealed and it's like a, a passive house type uh, uh, construction. And one of the things you need is something called a vapor control layer. And that's uh, a, normally a, uh, a plastic and paper 
membrane. And what you're looking at there is old banners from arts festivals, or and we actually had some from the Olympics. And someone gave us a thousand of these vinyl banners. And uh, we were actually able to use them in the construction of the building. So we used 450 of them in the construction of our building. Uh, and they, they just get burnt. Uh, yet they, it's a very tough material and could be reused. Every year at the School of Architecture, we make these pavilions for our students to exhibit their work. And the year we were making the waste house, that pavilion, which was actually already made out of secondhand material, was dismantled and reused to help make the waste house. We had another project at the same time, which was at a, a, a huge um, construction fair called EcoBuild in London. They commissioned us to make this nine meter high waste totem. So I went to them saying, you need to draw attention to the fact that waste is a valuable resource. And uh, so we made this waste to totem out of secondhand ply, but we also use secondhand paint. So the color on that totem is actually secondhand paint. There are companies now that will collect pots of paint from people, from local authorities. So a lot of people have paint stored away in garden sheds or under the stairs of their houses. For every four, every year that in the UK we, we buy over 400 million litres of paint, and every year 50 million litres of paint get unused and thrown away. So there's a huge source of paint just if you return your half-used or never-used pots of paint. The idea with the waste totem was draw, to draw people's attention to the issues of waste as a valuable resource. So we had a Twitter campaign, and that's what my colleague on the left there is doing, is uh, we, we uh, put these uh, the words on the, on the waste totem to draw people's attention to these issues. But then we reused that, but that thing there is made completely out of secondhand material, but then we, we broke it down and reused it. This is upstairs in the waste house. So you'll see the blue and gray panels there were then used for the third time here in the waste house. We also used material like chalk. So in Brighton, where we are, the ground below our feet is actually chalk. And we used waste chalk that was destined for landfill. We made a ram chalk wall, uh, wall out of it. So we used 10 tons of chalk. And that's our students on the left there making the wall. And then on the right are school children in the middle of summer when it's very hot, they're feeling how cool the wall, the wall is because heavyweight materials, they store heat and they keep you cool in the summer. So the material's got a story to it, but it's also got a function. And that's what I firmly believe is, if you understand how materials perform, you can quite create beautiful buildings like those buildings I showed you in Pakistan, where there's a complete understanding of the potentials of materials to keep you sheltered and warm in the winter and cool in the summer. So we also stored in our walls this sort of material, which is just lying around. So that was all going to landfill. So our building became a material store for the future. This is upstairs and we're using bicycle inner tubes as the soundproofing between floors. And we also use those inner tubes to seal around windows and doors to make the building airtight. We did have some brand new materials that went on this building. So the, the building is completely electric and it, it generates its electricity with these photovoltaic panels. So there's Kat again from Freegal, and she kept asking us, could we not use carpet tiles? And we thought again and again, and then we came up with this idea for wrapping the house with carpet tiles on the outside. So these two rather poor photographs show our building control officer from the Brighton City Council witnessing a fire test on those carpet tiles and it proved to be fireproof it had a very good fire rating so we actually ended up wrapping the outside of the house in these carpet tiles so we turned them back to front so the black side is the side that's normally stuck down to the floor but what was delightful here is the slide on the right shows you how we turned an external corner and we folded the tiles around the corner now that design idea came from a 16 year old carpenter, not an architect. So what was really nice working collaboratively with a lot of people is you, everybody chips in with ideas and everybody gets ownership of this project. So this is a detail of the wall as it is today, two years later, um, and those tiles from a distance look like slates, but it's actually carpet tiles. 
I'll skip over this this slide, but this is soon after opening. This is the house upstairs, and and it's not a house actually. It's a a studio for our MA in sustainable design, but it's also a plate, and they only use it two days a week. So on other days, anybody in the local community can come and use the waste house. And it's quite an inspirational place for people to have so many stories. And that's my colleague who runs the MA in sustainable design, and uh, they look at projects that are using waste materials or undervalued materials to uh, create products. But they also look in, and that's what he's standing next to, is a, a selection of polymers where we're looking at creating new materials out of organic and synthetic waste. And that's what it ended up looking like. And the slogan for the house that we had from the beginning is this idea that there's no such thing as waste, there's just stuff in the wrong place. Now, I've got quite a lot more I could talk about, and if, if no one stops me, I will carry on talking. So uh, what I wanted to do is to talk about the third step, which is where people use less material than normal to do what they do. And this is this idea of not just buildings, but whole cities as material stores for the future. And this is a project I really like. It's by a French practice called Lacatan and Vassal. And the image on the left shows a 1950s tower block that was due for demolition. And Lacatan and Vassal went to the mayor of Paris and said, we know you're going to demolish that building and we know you're then going to rebuild a new tower block. But what we will do if you commission us is to give you your new tower block for two thirds of the cost that you've already put aside for this new tower block. And you can see on the right there, that is the tower block complete. But fundamentally what they did is not demolish the tower block. So the image on the left there shows a new layer being put on the outside of the old tower block. And this is basically a, what we would call a winter garden or environmental buffer zone. So the original, I'll go back to the original slide and you can see here, there were concrete panels on the outside of the house here. And they were literally able to unbolt those, take them off one at a time, and then bolt on these new glazed boxes. And you can see there the box is being fixed. But what was amazing is you transfer, transform this environment, which has got small windows, so the people that live in the flats had to keep the lights on all the time. It's got poor ventilation and very poor insulation, so it's hot in the summer and cool in the winter. And this is what they're like now. So they, they've got a basically the new room that gives the flats increased floor area is also like a huge quadruple glazed unit that shelters you from the extremes of the weather outside. So it actually shelters you from excessive sun because of the solid roof and the solid floor, but also allows increased ventilation because you've got all of this, these glass panels that can open and you've got increased light but they've also got a sort of a 60% saving in energy bills on that building just by this sort of clever design. And crucially, they didn't demolish the building. This is an interesting little project from King's Cross in London where a practice called Carmody Groak, Carmody Groak, they did a pop-up restaurant at an old petrol station and they called it the filling station. And these panels here that they got permissioned and built for that project then when this project came to the end, they reused those panels and here they are again. And this is an external shot and then an internal shot for a Maggie Center. And there are a lot of Maggie Centers being built in the UK. And, um, but they're normally designed by people like Zaha Hadid or Richard Rogers. And this one, they reused the material from the filling station there for the ex external walls. And then these environments are made out of 20 year old Porter cabins, which are like the sort of cabins that you'll see on building sites. So they just got this waste material. And what I found most fascinating is that you've got a practice of architects thinking about one project being a material source for another. This is a project that hasn't been built yet, but it's very exciting for me because it will be built. And this is called the Urban Mountain in Oslo. And it's an existing tower block that will be extended and refurbished um, very soon, I understand, but it won't be demolished. What's amazing about it is that 
80% of the old material stripped out of the building will be used to, as a material source for the new building. So that's the building as it is. And that's it as it will be. And this is, these are three diagrams that show what they're going to do. So that they're, they're adding some new accommodation. They're removing some existing bits and then they're wrapping the, all of it. And most of the material they're doing all that with is materials that they're taking off the building in the first place. And you won't be able to see this, but it just reminds me of how they're doing it. So they're basically, for example, removing all the old aluminium and glass um, walls on the outside. And this scheme's all about recycling, actually. So they're taking, sending the aluminium back to the window manufacturers who are going to use that aluminium to make new windows. They get the glass from the cladding and they use that for internal partitions. And then where you've got this cradle to cradle um, logo, that's where they're using cradle to cradle certified products to as new products. So it's quite an interesting idea, but I think it's an amazing statistic to say that we'll reuse 80% of the material stripped out of the old building to supply the new refurbished building. Now here are people doing it for real. I've, I really uh, urge you guys to find out about Rota. Rota are based in Brussels and they are a firm of architects and designers and they can dismantle buildings one screw at a time. So that's what this is showing. This is showing a suspended ceiling system being carefully dismantled as well as internal partitions. So they have clients who want to refurbish their buildings. They have small clients, but they also have clients like Levi Jeans. And Levi came to them a couple of years ago and said, we want to strip out the interior of our buildings and have a new look. And that's what a lot of corporates do. Every five or seven years, they want a new look. But Levi said, look, we've done passive house design, low energy sustainable design. We want to do something else. So with Rota, what they did is carefully strip out the 1960s interior fittings and fixtures, clean them up, and then reuse them on the same building. But because Rota are designers, they were able to make the interiors look totally different with the old material. So in effect, nothing left sight. And instead of being demolished and thrown away, this material actually becomes valuable. And Rota have their own website where you can actually buy this sorts of material. So I think they're very interesting. And they are making money out of it. It actually saves clients money. So this isn't just being good for the sake of saving planet Earth, which a lot of us might want to do. This is actually a better, more intelligent business plan. So the last step is obviously when you're in the circular economy and apparently with if you're in a circular economy there'd be no waste ever produced so i think this is really early days and at the moment as far as my chapters are concerned this is the one that has the least good <laughs> examples of projects because i'm i'm not sure there are many genuine contemporary circular systems out there but we're just reminding ourselves of where we're going so there are two routes. There's the organic loop, remember, and the technological route. So I'm quite interested in this idea of growing your compostable building because obviously that's a, a building that one day it can be designed for remanufacture. So you design it in a way that can be taken apart one day quite easily and be a material resource for other buildings. But also ultimately this material can compost. It's not toxic. So I'm going to show you a couple of projects that I like from this. And this is one that I did myself called The House That Kevin Built. And it was actually a TV program in 2008. <clears throat> and the idea here was to make a prefabricated building out of organic material. And so we made the ground floor walls out of engineered timber. These, this is very strong engineered timber. And the idea here that there, there wasn't a lot of it, it just created a strong frame. And then you infilled the panels with straw, or in this case, it's lime and hemp. And what's lovely about these panels is that they, they're good insulators. They can use local materials because in this case, the frame was assembled in a barn near the site, a farmer's barn. And then we bought the farmer's straw to infill the panels. And then they spray both sides of the panel with a, a lime plaster. And then this is day one. And because it was a TV program, they, we some of the panels weren't finished. They showed you what was 
comprising the panel so you can see a lot of straw. And then the second day we got a different system to make the upstairs, which was the these boxes. And they what was interesting here was that this idea that we hardly made any well, we didn't make any waste on site at all. And the way these boxes were made, they were cut with a computer laser cutter. So they were designed on as a 3D computer model. And then literally that model told you just press print literally and uh, you got these boxes and they just hammered together without any nails or screws and then they all had these holes in them because when they were assembled and I'll show you on the next slide we then you got these holes here and you blew insulation into those holes and that insulation was made out of recycled paper but what was amazing is where you combine an organic material with a computer that's very accurate and you just don't get any wastage on site and that was one of the main things about this project zero waste on site so this is at the end of day three you've got a two-story building and this is at the end of day six where it's completed so it's a simple little building it had a a, a roof that created this this side of it here created hot water for the building and this was back in 2008 the sort of solar panels you might used to create electricity and there it is finished on day six what i really liked is these panels they were uh, that finished the outside of the building they were cut so precisely so you've got this joint up the, on the external corner here and you join the way they cut around this route rainwater pipe there was absolutely no wastage if you've done that on site with carpenters there'd be a pile of waste where they got the thing wrong but this is where computers can help us, I think. And what was amazing is that we also had our first, the UK's first ever A plus rated building from the point of view of energy. So, uh, so it was a very energy efficient building. And that was amazing because we were using fluffy organic materials in a very precise way. So that, that was very inspiring. And we've since worked on, we're developing larger projects. And this, so this is a multi-story building made out of straw, timber, hemp, willow organic materials but of course we're not the only people doing this and i just wanted to tell you about the work of francis kerry in burkina faso so francis is from burkina faso and actually he ended up getting a scholarship to study architecture in berlin so you probably know this guy and what as soon as he graduated he constructed a school in the village that he was born in he was the pretty much the only person that learned how to read and write in his village. And that was because he was the son of the chief. So he went back and what he's done is empower his community with this ability to value the construction techniques that of their, from their heritage, uh, revalue it, reappraise it. But that was the biggest task actually, he tells me, because they what they wanted is buildings made out of steel and glass, but of course that's not appropriate for their environment. So he got them re-evaluating re and revaluing re the materials like earth uh, and timber. But also, the f one of the first things he did is, is raise the roof off these buildings because he, he still got tin roofs on these buildings, which is the local way of doing things, but imported from Western society. But he lifted the roof off, so you've got a gap between the roof and the walls, and that's where air passes through so these buildings don't overheat <laughs> that dog's loud <laughs> anyway but you can see he's getting everybody in the community to build these buildings and that he uses his village as a test bed for new build when he gets a commission for a new building he uses everybody in the village to test different techniques like this bolting technique and also he invents new systems so these pots are found everywhere in his village they used to store grain, water, whatever. They used everywhere. There's a lot of broken pots. So he got them collected and then he started cutting them up and using them in this roof structure. So this make everywhere there's a pot, there isn't going to be concrete. So they make a lighter roof using less material and you get a beautiful environment. So you know, he'll say that most of these materials, if one day will end up being mud again, the, they're only mud bricks that are dried in under the sun. So that, you know, they wouldn't survive in our environment, but they survive down there. And, and he creates amazing, amazingly beautiful buildings. So the, 
made out the materials lying around just about but also i want to, this is what the one last study before just a couple of points but this is a building that's recently been opened at the university of east anglia in uh, in norwich in the uk and what was what's fascinating about this building is that it is also grown and uh, it's made out of straw and willow and timber salvaged from the university site so there was another building being demolished and they salvaged the hardwood timber the valuable timber out of that as well as other things but this the first thing that the architects did here when they got the commission was to find the local farmers and to order crops from these farmers so they ordered the bar the barley and the wheat to create the straw so they basically thatched this building And you've got yourself, so you've got a big proper university building made out of a vernacular that's normally associated, a material that's normally associated with little little houses. And this is the timber here. This is all being thrown away. It's Iroko timber, valuable hardwood from Africa that's been thrown away, was being thrown away, and they've been able to just salvage it for nothing and reuse it. But even on the inside, everything there is a grown material and while it's not being built it's locking carbon so the last thing you want to do with anything that's grown organically like this is burn it because that releases the carbon again but it obviously does the valuable job of creating oxygen and locking carbon so try and create buildings that lock carbon other people are doing more even more amazing things so these are bricks grown from mushroom mycelium and silica and this was a a pavilion in New York that was made out of these bricks and that's you know those bricks are grown it says they're corn stalks and mushrooms so these are bricks that are grown this is insulation made out of mycelium and mushrooms so that's grown insulation and you can use other products like solid wood which is literally wool and an and eco resin bio resin to make furniture so the other route you can grow your buildings, your organic buildings that one day will compost, or you're going to use the high-tech materials like steel and, and glass, but you've got to design them for disassembly. So they become the technical nutrients for new buildings. And this is one that's, um, I don't particularly like the look of, but this is William McDonough who helped write Cradle to Cradle. So this is the sort of architecture he's looking at, and I'm talking about the top bit of this building. So this is a steel and plastic building that's designed to be taken apart one day and then reassembled again. Now, one company is a German based company that comes out of Thomas Rau Architects, which I find really interesting at Turn To. They're called Turn To, and these are the people coming up with the concepts that I think are going to let us run with the idea of the circular economy for a bit. So, they've come up with this idea of buildings as material stores. So, this is one of their buildings with Thomas Rau. So this is one of the first buildings that's been cradle to cradle certified. So 90% of everything you can see there will is designed for remanufacture, reuse. They've come up with this other really interesting idea, which is that material should have a passport. And that means that there should be digital information that tells you exactly the, what that material is made of, but also how best to use it and how to take it apart and how to reuse it. So these, the idea is one day that all buildings will have material passports. And this is a Thomas Rao project, which is a 1960s uh, factory and office development. And he was asked to upgrade this building and he's done this with with only 10% of the material leaving the site uh, was thrown away. They've salvaged 90% of the material. So they did that by where they had to demolish buildings. They used the concrete to make new concrete. They broke it up and used it as aggregate for new concrete. There it is here. So they're actually recycling, but also they got low grade material like these pallets. And then they used it to, where's it gone? Oops. They've used it to line the outside of the old building. So there's timber and insulation that wrap the old buildings, but they also wrap the inside of the old buildings. 
So you get this sense of a, an older material. And then they've created these, this new roof that creates sheltered courtyards where there was open space before. But even with this big new steel structure, um, they've, got, they've used 60% less steel on that roof structure by going to a roller coaster designer um, uh, instead of your normal uh, steel fabricator. So that's the building when it's finished. Turn two invented this idea of leasing light. So where you don't buy a light fitting, you're the lighting supplier who we normally supplies you with a light bulb or a light fitting. Um, actually, you lease the light from them. So they t you tell them what level of lux you want, and it's their responsibility to give you the light fitting. And because the responsibility is with the manufacturer, they'd be more inclined to be responsible with the material and the product because it, they end up owning it at the end. They always own it. So it's their responsible to dis they're responsible to dispose it at the end. And this can go into clothes as well. So if you want jeans from mud jeans, you, they'll lease you the jeans because they want the cotton back as a valuable resource at the end of its life. So this is my last slide. So what I end up with is saying that if your design team are telling you that their green design will cost more than the norm, ask them to try harder. And if they can't, get a team who can. Thank you very much. And I can't hear you now. <laughs> Can you hear me? <laughs> I can't hear you. <laughs> I've lost you. I can't hear you, sorry. Hey, Duncan. Oh, hello. Sorry about that. <laughs> I just realized that we had our, uh, our mic muted, so you weren't able to, to hear All us. Right. But, um, <laughs> yeah. but yeah, we had a number of uh, people very interested in what you had to say, so it was a fantastic uh, run yeah. through kind of every, every scale and field. <laughs> and we'll be um, uh, 